What's up guys? My name is Jake. Welcome to Abandoned, episode 32. This is the show where we talk about some of the most interesting abandoned places in the world. We've talked about a few department store chains on this show, like uh, Target Canada, Circuit City, and Ames. For this episode, I wanted to stick in the Northeast United States and cover a discount retail chain similar to Ames called Bradley's. A brand that grew to be valued well over a billion dollars, only for it to quickly crumble. I do want to point out that there are some striking similarities between Ames and Bradley's. Anyways, let's go back to 1958, when three businessmen envisioned a store that would carry a wide selection of products at a discount price. It would serve a relatively untapped market for the time, and in the same year, the men opened their first store in New London, Connecticut. It was named after the Bradley International Airport in Hartford, Connecticut, where the three businessmen met to discuss their idea for the store. The discount store was proving to have a place in the market, and as a result, Bradley's was seen growing revenue. With momentum carrying through into 1961, the growing company was acquired by Stop and Shop, a Massachusetts-based grocery store company founded back in 1914. Bradley's became a subsidiary of the company, which meant the chain could now begin receiving the funding it needed to expand its brand with more locations. Discount stores were becoming extremely popular towards the late 60s, and by 1968, Bradley's now had 52 stores and earned an annual revenue of $139 million. So far, the acquisition of Bradley's was proving to be a smart one for its now parent company, Stop and Shop. As the 70s came around, Bradley's continued to expand along with the booming retail market. More stores continued to open in the Northeast United States, a region now being dominated by discount store giants. With the company's growth, they set a strong stance on the quality of their stores and the products that they sold. Bradley's was marketing themselves as a high-quality brand which sold merchandise at low costs. With these efforts in effect, changes were made in their stores to mold themselves around what was popular for consumers. Stores had received received renovations and upgrades, which meant serious money and care was being put into their stores. This proved to be extremely effective for the chain, as sales and revenue grew exponentially. By the end of 1979, Bradley's sales had grown to $634 million. In the early 80s, the chain saw greater competition in the country, with rising discount stores like Kmart, Ames, and Walmart, all of which were fighting for market share. Bradley's proved to be a strong brand, and despite the growing competition, by 1982 the chain had brought in over $871 million in sales. With Bradley's steady and increasing sales growth, the company had planned for even more expansion. And like most retailers that had their sights on physical growth, instead of building new locations, they would just buy out other companies and rebrand their stores. And that's exactly what Bradley's did. In 1982, the chain announced they had acquired 13 Memco locations in the Washington, D.C. area. Bradley's was still set on conveying themselves as a high-quality discount retailer, and had intended to open another 20 new stores in the next year. By 1984, Bradley's was seeing substantial positive growth, and by year's end, the chain made $85.2 million in operating profit, and $1.4 billion in sales. Of course, with this growth meant more expansion. In March of 1985, Bradley's announced they had purchased 18 out of the 41 stores from the Jefferson Ward brand, a division of the Montgomery Ward Company. The reason why Bradley's only acquired 18 was because the additional 23 stores were located in Florida, and the company wanted to remain in the Northeast United States. Even though Bradley's expansions were aggressive, the chain still lost market share by the end of the year. This worried the company's parent, Stop and Shop, which had several of its chains lose money that year, and the sign of Bradley's, one of the company's more profitable chains lose money, was a little alarming. So action was taken, and in 1986, Stop and Shop had removed Bradley's president, which actually resulted in sales rising once again. The chain now had an annual reported sales of almost $2 billion. By the next year, Bradley's was back to expanding further, with 11 new stores planned to be opened, and 13 planned to be remodeled. Bradley's counted as a significant revenue stream for Stop and Shop, so it's no wonder why the company was pushing for expansion. The chain was building a huge presence in the Philadelphia and New Jersey areas, after another purchase of the Two Guys Company, and a 530,000 square foot distribution center. 
Their parent company, Stop and Shop, was being targeted by the Dart Group Corporation by a hostile takeover bid. This basically meant that the Dart Corporation was buying a large amount of shares and attempting to replace the board of directors of Stop and Shop, who would be in favor of the Dart acquisition. The company needed to take evasive actions to avoid becoming a subsidiary of itself to the Dart Corporation. So in 1988, Stop and Shop succeeded with a leveraged buyout and became a privately held company. This resulted in and Stop and Shop acquiring a huge amount of debt nearing over a billion dollars. You know, I think Aaron Sorkin's The Newsroom says it best. I am offering you one full dollar per share more than Savannah. So if this is about the money, you'll take it. Four billion dollars for a 62 billion dollar company? It's a steal. It's not! I think he's trying to say you don't have four billion dollars. How much do I have? I don't know, but it's somewhere in the ballpark of nothing close to four billion dollars! This severely affected Bradley's future plan, and the chain had sold the lease to 37 of their stores in North Carolina and Virginia. Even though Bradley's was scaling back drastically, this did mean that the brand could focus more on the markets it was strong in. By 1989, Bradley's brought in new management and overhauled much of their operations. Many new marketing campaigns were introduced, such as Mrs. B, a spokesperson which focus groups said would reach out to customers. The chain also began updating and modernizing their stores with new equipment to help streamline operations. Bradley spent around $34 million to implement these new in-store changes. Following this though, sales were slightly down from the previous year, however still holding steady and even growing in some cases at $1.8 billion. Stop and Shop was struggling with debts, and by 1991, they decided to undo their leveraged buyout and went public again in an effort to pay off their debt. In the decision to go public, Bradley's was separated from the company in 1992. This culminated in Bradley's trading stock for the first time, which resulted in 11 million shares sold, and this stock momentum carried through the strong Christmas season. However, this momentum did not last long, as 1993 proved to be a difficult year for Bradley's from tough competition. This is where things started moving downhill for the company. To counteract the falling sales, Bradley's began cutting costs. Changes were made in their stores, and management staff was reduced, eliminating 280 jobs. Despite all of this though, the chain decided to open 10 more stores. With sales dropping and the company entering a terrible financial state and losing money, suppliers were starting to take notice. By 1995, Bradley's was now operating 136 stores in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Virginia. In June, the company had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. In a statement, the company said it had been able to pay its debts on time, but was forced to file because many of its suppliers had stopped shipping goods, fearing they would not be paid by the company. The only way to get their merchandise back in their stores was to file for protection. Bradley's had lost over $30 million in 1995. Investors did not react well to the filing, as their stock had dropped to $1.50 a share, an 80% decrease of value since the beginning of the year. By 1996, the company made the decision to close some of its underperforming stores. While the company was losing a massive amount of money during this time, with its bloated infrastructure and stiff competition, by 1998, things were kind of improving. By the following year, the company was able to exit its Chapter 11 reorganization, with about $160 million in value and $550 million in liabilities. Bradley's demise was in sight, yet the company was determined to keep the brand afloat. Bradley saw a huge boom once a competitor discount retailer, Caldor, closed all of its doors following its liquidation. Sales for Bradley shot up massively, however by 2000, the former Caldor stores had been rebranded into new locations for Kohl's, Walmart, Ames, and others. As soon as these stores opened, Bradley's was sent into a death spiral. The company had just collected too much debt, and at this point, there was nothing that could be done to save the company. Hundreds of millions of dollars would need to be paid off before it would ever become profitable. By December of 2000, Bradley's had filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. The company had signed a deal with a Boston-based liquidation firm, and soon after, in January of 2001, Bradley's stores began being liquidated and closed when all of their assets had been sold. Bradley's had liquidated and closed all of their 105 remaining stores by year's end. 
over 10,000 employees lost their jobs. Bradley's quickly fell from what seemed like a promising continuation, which really was only temporary and effectively acted as a false wall over their financial problems. By 2002, all of their stores had either been purchased by other retailers or left unused and abandoned. It's been a while since 2002, so coming across an abandoned Bradley store is relatively rare. From what I've read, there are one or two left in the United States. This Bradley's location in Hamilton, New Jersey, was one of the remaining abandoned stores. With the power remaining on, the exterior was sealed off, with the interior slowly decaying over a span of 14 years. Water began trickling through the ceiling and immense amounts of mold began covering the walls of the building. Signs and branding were left on the walls, and departments remained with their changing rooms in the center. Moving towards the back of the building, employee areas are in extremely rough shape, with mold covering the walls and light fixtures falling from the ceiling. The entire building has missing ceiling tiles from them falling out of place due to the weight of collecting water. As a result, the floors are covered with still brown water collecting from the rusting steel above. Much like the Ames in Baltimore, at this point, the space could probably never be used again. In 2015, this former abandoned Bradley's location was torn down and replaced by a Walmart. Only a few former Bradley's locations exist abandoned. The majority have been either torn down or rebranded for what was probably a competitor for the chain. In the end, the brand had too much competition that it just couldn't compete with. It was just too small to keep itself going when it was up against stores like Ames and Walmart. Of course it had other problems, but in the end, the brand was losing market share and money and larger companies just killed it. Even if they did last though, they were still a smaller company compared to the major discount retailers now. And even like Kmart and Sears are falling at a critical rate. Ames, the third largest discount retailer and one of Bradley's major competitors, had declared Chapter 7 and closed all of its stores just a year after Bradley's. So really, the discount stores of the past just aren't performing anywhere near the way they were before. Really, just take a look at the state of JC Penny or Kmart, two brands that I will probably cover in the future. Bradley's excelled in the late 70s and early 80s with its growth, and those who do remember shopping there usually have fond memories of the chain. It is a testament on how quickly a brand can fall though. Its stores now left abandoned or overtaken by the very competitors that put them out of business. It was the quick and inevitable death of the 43-year-old department store chain. I would like to thank this episode's sponsor, Audible. While making this video, I was interested in learning about the economics of the modern-day department store decline. I found a great book that explains just that, called From Main Street to Mall, The Rise and Fall of the American Department Store. It's written by Vicki Howard and examines the political and social complications to the American department store. If you're interested in taking a look, Audible is the place to go listen to it. Even if you're interested in something a little different, Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks. So if you want to go check out what Audible has to offer, and to get a 30-day free trial, use the link audible.com bsf. As always, when you're supporting them, you're in return supporting Abandoned and myself. Once again, that's audible.com bsf. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, and thank you very much for watching. to be nice and I've been wondering that since 95 if society takes its toll where does all the good money go my songs never made a difference I found no bullshit into my existence